And to start off today, before we talk about this hymn, I want to give you an observation. And the observation is this. We live our life in cycles. And to prove it, just out of curiosity, how many of you have one of these hanging in your house? And for those of you watching on the thing, there's a picture of a calendar up on the screen. I grew up with one hanging in the walls of my house. Every year, we buy my in-laws one with pictures of the kids on it. Now, I'll be honest, we don't have a physical calendar in the Schultz house, but we do use a calendar. We just happen to use the calendar on our phones. And we use calendars for so many different reasons. We use them to track our schedule. You write stuff like, I have a doctor's appointment next Tuesday. Oh, the Joneses are coming over for dinner next Friday. Oh, the car is getting inspected on the 20th. You mark things on the calendars like, the kids are on spring break this week. This is the week that we're taking our summer vacation. And then think about all those different holidays that we celebrate here in the United States that are on the calendar. President's Day, Valentine's Day, Martin Luther King Day, Mother's Day, Memorial Day, Father's Day, Independence Day, Labor Day, Columbus Day, Halloween, Veterans Day, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's. And those are the ones that I just thought up off the top of my head when I was working on this. And for many of you, you have traditions surrounding those holidays on the calendar. Valentine's Day, you go out to dinner with your significant other. Mother's Day, brunch. Father's Day, golfing. Barbecues on Memorial Day. Fireworks on Independence Day. Camping on Labor Day. Family dinner on Thanksgiving. Christmas Eve, church service. And you mark that all along on your calendar. Or how about those special days that are just on your calendar? Those milestones, those remembrances. Birthdays, wedding anniversaries, maybe it's job anniversaries, maybe it's even something difficult, like the death of a family member or friend. Calendars are an important part of our lives. It gives us order. It helps us remember and celebrate those special days. And you know what? We find calendars in the scripture. Throughout the Old Testament, God ordained special holidays and feasts at certain times of the year. He called Israel to observe them and celebrate them. He called Israel to praise God, to thank him for what he had done, to pause and reflect. Throughout the scripture, you'll read about stuff like the Sabbath, Passover, Feast of Unleavened Bread, Feast of First Fruits, Feast of Weeks, the Festival of Trumpets, the Day of Atonement. We also call that Yom Kippur, the Feast of Booths. And what about us as followers of Jesus Christ? We have the same thing. We have special seasons and days that we celebrate that we praise God, that we remember what he has done for us, that we celebrate that we are saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, that we have the hope of everlasting life. Now, truth be told, depending on the church you go to and depending on the Christian tradition you belong to, those various seasons and celebrations may be different. But all faithful Christians celebrate two, two big holidays. Okay, what are they? You know them. They are Christmas and Easter. And what happens at Christmas and Easter is very important. But many traditions including the Lutheran Church, they created a calendar, a church calendar. 
And it's focused around these two main holidays that we celebrate, Christmas and Easter. Now some churches call it the church calendar, other churches call it the liturgical calendar. The word li liturgical or liturgy or any form of it, it basically means order. When we say liturgical worship, we mean that there is an order to the service, prayers and songs and responses, and we usually find that order in a hymnal. Many churches use what's called the lectionary, and what the lectionary is is basically an order of scripture readings throughout the year. I sometimes use it, I sometimes don't. And throughout the church year, there are various special days and holidays that we observe, where we remember God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and what He has done for us. Some of these seasons are times of preparation. Think about the season of Advent and Lent. It helps us to pause and focus and remember as we get ready for Christmas and Easter. Days like Ash Wednesday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday. We celebrate things like Jesus Ascension, Pentecost, Trinity Sunday, times where we pause and remember. We remember events in Jesus' life, like his baptism and transfiguration. And for us Lutherans and many other Protestants, Reformation Day. And not only are there these special seasons and days and holidays, but there are also colors that go with them. You notice behind me on the high altar, we have two pyramid banners, and they happen to be green right now. And we have many different colors throughout the year. And the truth is, if you would try to figure out what the colors represent, you're going to find like 30 different reasons. So I went to the LCMS website and I said, so, so what does our tradition believe? So here are some of the colors that we use to remember and celebrate. There's blue. And we use blue during Advent. Blue is the color of the sky. During Advent, we remember and celebrate and prepare for Jesus' birth. But Advent is also the focus on Jesus' second coming. And Jesus ascended into the sky, and the scripture promises he will return again in the same way. There's purple. We use purple during Lent. Purple is a color of sorrow. They placed a purple robe on Jesus right before they placed the crown of thorns on his head. We use black for Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. Black is the color of mourning, and we do so in somber reflection. We use the color red, and red is the color of celebration. We use red at Pentecost, Reformation Day, Palm Sunday, but red is also used on special occasions, the ordination of a pastor or a pastor's funeral. Church anniversaries, they use red, and red is a celebration, and red comes from the red flames of the Holy Spirit descending at Pentecost. Green. Green is used in what we call normal time or regular time. Green is the color that we probably have up the most. And when we think of green, we think of plants. And green just means spiritual growth throughout the year. Finally, there is white. And white is used during Christmas and Easter. White is the color of purity. It reminds us that Jesus came, that Jesus died, and Jesus rose again. It reminds us also that our sins can be washed as white as snow through Jesus. And so those are the colors that we use throughout the year. And so what is a calendar, and what is these church colors, what does any of this have to do with a hymn? Well, let me explain. It's the early 1800s. 
And one of those special days, Trinity Sunday, is just around the corner. Trinity Sunday comes eight weeks after Easter. And on Trinity Sunday, I know this is going to be hard, but what do you celebrate on Trinity Sunday? There we go, the Trinity. I thought it was a softball for you to hit. We celebrate the existence of God in eternal three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And let me just pause for a minute, because the Trinity, to be honest, it's a concept that is impossible for us humans to fully understand, let alone explain. God is infinitely greater than we are, and so it would be impossible for any of us, even the smartest person to ever live, to be able to fully and completely understand God. Think about it this way. The smartest dog in the world is never going to fully understand and explain human beings. But yet God, out of his love for us, gives us a glimpse into who he is. And the Bible teaches us that God is one, but it also teaches us that the Father is God, that Jesus is God, and that the Holy Spirit is God. And even though we might not fully be able to explain and understand the Trinity, and even though the word Trinity never actually appears in the Bible, its teaching does. And while we may not be able to understand it, we know that it is true and based on the teaching of Holy Scripture. So Trinity Sunday is coming. And Reginald Herber, there's Reginald right there, he's an Anglican priest. And he's looking for a hymn for his congregation to sing on Trinity Sunday. However, the trouble was he couldn't find one. And so what he does is he decides to write one himself. And the hymn he writes is Holy, Holy, Holy. It's hymn 507 in our hymnal, but it's in hundreds of hymnals throughout the world. Just some background on Reginald Herbert. Born in 1783 near Cheshire, England, he was born into what was described as an intellectual and prosperous family. At age 17, he went to study at Oxford, where he excelled. After graduation, he was ordained into a small Anglican church and served 16 years in that small church. He was known as being a writer of poems and hymns and essays in magazines. In 1723, he was sent to India to serve as Bishop of Calcutta. However, the climate and job pressures took its toll on his health. And in 1826, after preaching to a large outdoor crowd, he suffered heat stroke and died. He was only in his 40s. In our hymnal, we have four hymns written by him. Holy, 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 brightest and best of the stars of morning, the Son of God goes forth to war, and who and God who made earth and heaven. But today we're going to be looking at his hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy. And before I move into the hymn, any questions about him or about anything? Any questions about the church calendar or the liturgical colors? And if you want to know how I know what color to put up, I print out a sheet off the internet. There's one right back there in the sacristy if you need to look at it to find out what colors go with what events. So they'll be green until Reformation, then we'll be red, and then for All Saints Day we'll be white, and then we'll go back to green again, and then we'll be blue for Advent. Well, let's just look at verse 1. 
Would you read it with me here on the screen? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. If you've ever spent any time in church, you've heard the word holy. But do you know what the word holy means? At its core, what holy means is set apart. And when we describe God as holy, we describe him as being set apart from everything else. There is nothing else like God. Now we describe many things as holy. We say the Holy Bible, or Holy Baptism, or Holy Communion. And what that means is, we mean that these things are set apart for God. The Holy Bible, it's a book set apart for God. In Holy Baptism, you were set apart for God. In Holy Communion, we take a meal that is set apart for God. And so we start off this hymn by saying, holy, holy, holy. But why three holies? Absolutely. Well, first, do you know, holy, 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 it comes directly from Scripture. It appears twice in the Bible, once in the Old Testament, the second time in the New Testament. First in Isaiah 6. This is what Isaiah writes. It was the year that King Uzziah died, and I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Attending him were mighty seraphim. Each had six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. They were calling out to each other, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. Their voice shook the temple to its foundation, and the entire building was filled with smoke. The second instance comes in Revelation 4, when the apostle John has a vision. He says, Instantly I was in the Spirit, and I saw the throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones, like jasper and cannelim, and the glow of the emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. Twenty-four elders surrounded him. Twenty-four elders, sorry, twenty-four elders, twenty-four thrones surrounded him, and twenty-four elders sat on them, and they were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes and lightning and rumble of thunder, and in front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold Spirit of God. In front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. In the center and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes, front and back. The first of these living beings was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had the face of a human, the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Oops, sorry. Each of these living beings had six wings. Their wings each carried all over, each were covered all over with eyes inside and out. Day and night and night and day they kept saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the one who was and who is and is still to come. God gave visions to Isaiah and John of the throne room of God. And in it, they heard these heavenly creatures singing out, Holy, Holy, Holy. And so going back to verse 1, Holy, 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 it comes directly from Scripture. Holy, Holy, Holy. He's writing a hymn for Trinity Sunday. So holy is God the Father. Holy is God the Son. Holy is God the Holy Spirit. 
And he writes out by saying, from the moment I wake up, my songs of praise shall be lifted up to heaven to you. For you are merciful, yet you are mighty. God, you are in three persons. You're the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Questions about verse 1 before we move on. Verse 2. Let's read it together. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea, cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, which wert and art and evermore shall be. What is going on here? Going back to Revelation 4, this vision that John had in heaven. It says, Whenever the living beings give glory to God and thank the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns down before the throne, saying, you are worthy, O God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and they exist because you created what you, play, what you pleased. Verse 2 comes directly from Revelation 4. And so here we come to Revelation 4, and I'll admit it, it sounds kind of crazy. What's up with these 24 elders? What's the deal with these creatures flying around? And as I stand up here, I'll tell you this. It's not easy for me to say. Because the book of Revelation, it's what's known of as apocalyptic writing. And apocalyptic writing is highly symbolic. So what do these symbols mean? Is this really happening? Is this not really happening? The truth is, I can't give the answer. But let me try to explain what I think is going on here. And so he writes, Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee. And so, saints, what is he talking about? Well, Giving an idea of where this verse comes, the 24 elders are a symbolic representation of the saints. Now, who are the saints? Now, some traditions have their own view of the saints, and I'm not going to stand up here right now because I don't know all the background about what the Catholic Church teaches about saints, but let me tell you what I believe the Bible teaches about saints. You see, every time the word saint appears in the Bible, it never refers to one specific person, but always refers to a group of people, and a specific type of group of people. Let me take this. This is 1 Corinthians 1, 2. And I have to use the English Standard Version here, because the NLT and the NIV, they don't use the word saint, they use the word holy people. But this is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. To the church of God that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Jesus Christ, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and Savior. When the Bible talks about the saints, what it's talking about is all of us. Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, the body of Christ, the church. And so if we believe that all Christians are saints, that the body of Christ, the church, they are the saints, why do we still have saints in the Lutheran church? I mean, you're sitting right now 
in St. Luke Lutheran Church. Well, we don't view the saints the same way as the Roman Catholic Church does or other churches do. We don't pray for the saints. I'm sorry, pray to the saints, or as the Catholic Church teaches, ask the saints to pray for us. It kind of has to do with Martin Luther and him being a Catholic and us. Basically, this is what we view the saints. We give thanks to God for faithful servants in his church. We remember what God did for them and their faith. We look to them as examples of what we should do in faith and holy living. Before I move on, any questions about what we view about the saints? So these 24 elders, most likely the number 24 represents the 12 tribes of the nation of Israel that was set apart by God that believed in the promise of the Messiah and the 12 disciples who spread the gospel of Jesus to the world. That's where we get the number 24. These 24 elders, they represent the church. They represent the faithful. They represent the saved. And what do they do? Well, he describes it. They are casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. Once again, going back to Revelation, this vision that John had in heaven, he wrote, in front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. And then later on, the 24 elders fell down and worshiped the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. And they laid down their crowns before the throne. Crowns? Where do we get crowns from? Well, the Bible mentions that the faithful will receive crowns. After all, what gives us hope and joy and what will be our proud reward and crown as we stand before our Lord Jesus when he returns. It is you. Yes, you are our pride and joy. In 2 Timothy, a prize awaits me, the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on the day of his return. And the prize is not just for me, but for all who eagerly look forward to his appearing. In James 1, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterwards, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Oh, in 1 Peter 5, 4, and the great shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of never-ending glory and honor. The Bible teaches that the faithful will get crowns for persevering, for enduring testing and temptation, for following Jesus Christ. Now, does that mean we will all get physical crowns in heaven? No clue. Are these just symbolic crowns that John saw? I don't know. I wasn't with John. I didn't see it. But let me tell you what's happening here and what this scripture means and what this part of the verse means. It means that despite whatever we do on earth to get these crowns, they're not what's to be worshipped. We don't wear them like accomplishments. Look what I did. Look what I earned. No. They're given as gifts from Jesus. Jesus is the one who is to be worshipped and praised and glorified. Without Jesus, we have nothing. In his presence, all of our good deeds, they are worthless and they are meaningless. And so we give them over to God in praise and worship to him. Going back to the verse. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before him, 
which wert and art and evermore shall be. Cherubim and seraphim. What are they? Nope. Nope. They are not angels. What do you mean? I've grown up there learning angels. I remember I type in cherubim in my search engine and an angel pops up. Let me explain. Cherubim and seraphim are heavenly creatures. Seraphim are only mentioned in Isaiah. Cherubim seem to be mentioned in other places in the scripture. Actually, the first time that cherubim are mentioned is in Genesis 3. Adam and Eve have fallen into sin, and God banishes them from the Garden of Eden. And this is what Genesis 3 tells us. After sending them out, the Lord stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the Tree of Life. They were kicked out of the Eden, and he put cherubim there as basically security guards to keep Adam and Eve out. The tabernacle, and then the temple, and articles in the tabernacle and the temple, the cover of the Ark of the Covenant, the veil that separated the Holy of Holies, they were decorated with cherubim. So what does cherubim look like? Well, Ezekiel... My, many scholars think that this is Ezekiel's describing cherubim. This is what he writes. From the center of the crowd, four living beings that look like human, except that they each had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight and their feet had hooves like those of a calf and shone like brushed bronze. Each of their four wings, I could see human hands. So each of these four living beings had four faces and four wings. The wings of the living being touched the wings of the living being beside it. Each one moved straight forward in any direction without turning around. Each had a human face in the front, the face of a lion on the right side, the face of an ox on the left side, and the face of an eagle on the back. Each had two pair Sorry, each had two pair of outstretched wings. One pair stretched out to touch the wings of the living being on either side, and the other pair covered its body. They went in whatever direction the spirit chose, and they moved straight forward in any direction without turning around. The living beings looked like bright coals of fire and brilliant torches, and lightning seemed to flash back and forth among them, and the living beings darted to and for like flashes of lightning. All I can say is that they look crazy. And if one of them walked into the room today, we'd be scared out of our minds. And that's the point. Cherubim are supposed to be intimidating. The first place they were mentioned is they were standing guard of the tree of life in the Garden of Eden. They are placed throughout the temple, on the Ark of the Covenant, on the veil that separated the Holy of Holies. And they are there to remind you that you are in the presence of God Almighty. And that is something that you need to take seriously. Seraphim, on the other hand, they're only mentioned in Isaiah, going back to Isaiah. Attending him were mighty seraphim. Each had six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two wings they covered their feet. And with two they flew. Now there's been some debate. Are seraphim or cherubim, are they the same thing? Are they different things? I don't know. This is what I do know. They are amazing, mighty creatures. Created by God. And what it seems like in Scripture is that they remain 
in the presence of God. And as they remain in the presence of God, they worship him and sing out, holy, holy, holy. But I told you they weren't angels. Angels are different. While cherubim and seraphim seem to remain in the presence of God, angels don't. Angels are messengers. That's what angel means. Messenger. Angels are sent by God with messages. The angel Gabriel was sent to Zechariah to tell him that his wife Elizabeth was going to have a baby, John the Baptist. Later, Gabriel was sent to Mary to tell her that she was going to become pregnant with Jesus, God the Son. Angels were sent to the shepherds on that very first Christmas to give them the message that the Savior of the world was born and this would be great joy to all people. On Easter Sunday, God sent angels, and we talked about that in a Bible study. Could have been as little as two, could have been as many as six. He sent angels to declare that Jesus Christ was risen from the dead. And angels are still likely in our presence today. This is what Hebrews 13 tells us. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers. For some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. Now I'll admit something to you all today. When it comes to these spiritually beings in the heavenly realms, I'm no expert. But if that's something that you would like to study scripturally, I can read a few books. I can learn stuff about it. We can talk about it. So once again, going back to verse 2. Verse 2 is basically based on Revelation 4, Isaiah 6. And what verse 2 reminds us is that right now, in heaven, in the throne room of God, worship is taking place. The saints, our loved ones, who have died in the faith, are right now standing before Jesus, standing before God the Father, standing before the Holy Spirit. They're casting down those crowns in worship to Him. These heavenly beings, the cherubim and the seraphim, they are flying around heaven right now. They are worshiping God, declaring that He is holy. And so the question I have for us is that when we sing this song in worship, we join heaven in worshiping God. And so the question is, do you truly worship God? And I know you do. The Bible tells us that one day, Everyone will. Philippians 2. That the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One day, everyone will have to get on their knee and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. I know for me, I'm so glad that I do it willingly right now. Verse two, I know there was a lot there. Questions about verse two before we move on. Questions about cherubim and seraph, cherubim and seraphim. I was combining them into one thing there for a second. About angels. This is what I can say about angels. I, I don't know, the Bible never gives us, from what, from what I've read right now, what angels actually look like. But every time an angel appears, the first words out of the angel's mouth is, don't be afraid. 
So obviously there's something about it that brings fear to people, but then peace when they hear that message from God. Well, I was thinking about angels. Uh, do they have another job? I mean, I'm thinking of uh, Luther's morning prayer. At the end, we say, Let the holy angels be with me that the wicked. That the evil foe may have no power over me. They're, they're, they're messengers from God. And, and once again, that's me not, not knowing as much because there is, you know, there's only two angels named in Scripture. Gabriel and Michael the archangel. And if you remember, Michael the archangel fought over the body of Moses with Satan. And Michael the archangel will lead. So, so uh, without, without me getting into all the details, I know like the, the word angel, it's, it's Greek, it's angelos. It means messenger, but, but the, 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 you know, we, we talk about angels protecting us and being with us. And if you remember when Jesus was tempted in, in the desert for 40 days, who came and gave Jesus comfort during that? Angels. And so when we say, let your holy angels be with me, you know, you, the holy angels comforted Jesus. Let them comfort me as well. And that goes back to what Hebrews says. You might be entertaining angels and you don't even know it. That person came and you said, wow, I really needed that person at that time. That, and I didn't even know that was an angel. Now, I'm not saying like Arlene is an angel and she gives you, obviously she's a human being and you wouldn't, but, but that's a whole different study. But, but yeah, I, I'll be happy to, you know, if we want to do a Bible study about that and spiritual beings and angels and demons and all that stuff, we can, we can talk about that. I would just have to do more research on that. You know, I was always under the impression, this is my impression, that uh, cherubim were uh, children, small children. <laughs> and do you know where you get that from? We tend to get that from, like, artwork. That, that, that we get that impression, uh, I think, a lot in Renaissance art when, when, you know, there was cherubim paintings. And, yeah, that's... That's the image that, you know, if I would say angel, all of you got a picture in your head right now. There's a halo, there's wings, there's maybe a white robe. Okay, we're looking at the stained glass window over there with a picture of an angel with wings. I don't know if the angels have wings. The cherubim and seraphim have wings, and it's more than one set of wings. And some of those wings are covered with eyes. That's freaky. And they've got faces of lions and oxes and human beings and eagles. That's scary. Um, I, I will be happy to do more research. But going back to the point of this study, they worship God. Even these amazing creatures that are beyond our wildest comprehension humble themselves and worship God. Verse 3, let's read it together. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, throw the eye of sinful man, thy glory may not see. Only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in power, in love and purity. Once again, there is a theme throughout Scripture of light and and darkness. That sin is darkness, but Jesus Christ is light. And Jesus Christ came to be the light that shines in the darkness, and darkness will never overcome him. From John 1, the Word gave life to everything that was created, and his life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. 
And so when we say, holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, through the eye of sinful man, thy glory may not see. We are sinful. Our sins have separated us from God. And we have become blind to what he has done for us. But yet, out of his love, he has sent his son, Jesus Christ. The Trinity is involved in our salvation. God the Father loved us so much that he sent God the Son to die for us, to rise again so that we could have the hope of everlasting life. Through God the Holy Spirit, we can by grace call upon Jesus Christ to be our Lord and Savior. In Revelation 6, we, we hear the famous verse, For the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We were in darkness, but Jesus has given us the light. Only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in power, in love, and purity. We are reminded throughout the pages of the Bible that there is none like God. First Samuel, no one is holy like the Lord. There is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. First Chronicles, O oh Lord, there is none like you. We have never seen or heard of another God like you. Psalm 86, no pagan God is like you, O oh Lord. None can do what you do. There is none like the God we serve, like God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. In Him, we find forgiveness through His love, through His power, through His purity. Questions about verse 3. Verse 4. Holy, let's read it together. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all the works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. We sing here, all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Have you ever taken a moment and just looked at God's creation and how amazing it is? I've never been there, but maybe you have. The Grand Canyon. Amazing, beautiful. I think all of us have been to Niagara Falls and seen the amazing power of that water cascading down that rock. Maybe you've had the chance to get away from the city and looked up at the sky at an amazingly beautiful starry night. Maybe you've even tried to take a few minutes and count all the stars and you've given up. Maybe you've had the privilege <coughs> on vacation somewhere and gone scuba diving and happened to just look at the world under the sea. Even in a fish tank or at the aquarium, it's amazing. God's creation is absolutely breathtaking. The Bible tells us that in it, God reveals himself. Psalm 19, the heavens proclaim the glory of God. 
The skies display his craftsmanship. Or Romans 1. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature, so that no one has an excuse for not knowing him. Friends, you want to know how I know that there's a God? I look outside and see him. His glory is displayed for us to see. And can I tell you something? All this that we see that's amazing and beautiful, it's still sin-stained. It's still affected by the fall. Those fish were amazing and beautiful in the colors, but they're all going to die. That beautiful tree that you see that you sit under to read a book, it's going to die. Niagara Falls, it can dry up and be gone. For how beautiful it is now, imagine how much, and I'm going to use bad English here, more beautiful. There, that's the right English. Beautifuler? See? This is why I'm glad people don't grammatically correct my sermons, because they would be, I'd get an F on that. It's going to be so much greater when Jesus comes back and restores things to the way it was before sin entered the world. And so we declare, all thy works shall praise your name in earth and sky and sea. God, even creation, sing praises to you. So we should. We should declare, holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. He closes the hymn as the way he begins it, declaring that the Holy Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, is merciful and also mighty. So that's holy, holy, holy. Questions? Observations? Anything that, that you have that you want to know? Questions about anything that we've talked about here before we wrap stuff up? Don? Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, you know, it's when I study this stuff, I, I, I mean, I've read Revelation 4. I've sung Holy Holy both dozens, if not hundreds of times. And then when you're doing research, you go, oh, yeah, that's where he got it from. That's, of course, that, you know, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. That's right there in Revelation 4. That's, okay, so what are these crowns about? What are these... And, and I'll, be, I'll be completely honest with this. Pastors who did all this research before the internet, they deserve their weight in gold. I mean, I'll get out books and stuff, but to me, it's so much easier to, to search for stuff. You know, I had, a, I had a professor in seminary who said, with computers and the internet, we're just giving you degrees right now. And he, he also laughed about, he wrote his doctoral dissertation on a typewriter, and he goes, when you write on a typewriter, and you have a typo on page 12 of page 50, you gotta type it all over again. And he said what made him really feel bad was when he went to the Smithsonian, and the typewriter in the Smithsonian was a newer model than what he wrote his doctoral dissertation on. <laughs> to be honest with you, I haven't decided what we're gonna study next week, but we, I'll figure that out. I, have, I actually have a couple of books that go through some of this stuff. So, well, if nothing else, let us just close in a word of prayer. Lord, as we gather here today, we say, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Thank you, Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. 
And we worship you and we give you praise and we give you glory. We thank you that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to die so that we could have the gift of everlasting life. We praise you. We give you thanks. In your holy name we pray. Amen.